All right, I think there are a few more people trickling in, but let's just get the show on the road. All right, so hello everybody and welcome to our next session of our quantitative plant biology webinar series. For those of you who don't know who are new here, Quantitative Plant Biology is an open access journal published by Cambridge University Press in association with the John Ennis Center. And we are delighted to be bringing you this webinar series thanks to our editors, authors, and the support of the John Ennis Center. Uh, today, we're pleased to feature our very own editor-in-chief of Quantitative Plant Biology, Olivier Amont. Uh, in a moment, I'll be handing over to Dale Sanders here who will introduce today's session. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, you've all joined in a listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear us but not able to speak to us. Uh, however, you do have the opportunity to submit chat questions, uh, so you can type those chat questions into the Q&A of the control panel there, the, usually at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, you may send in your questions at any time during the webinar today. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar today. Uh, if we are unable to get through all of the questions, there will be a follow-up email after today's webinar where you can send those questions and we'll try to get those answered for you as well. Uh, should you experience any technical difficulties, please add this to the questions box and a member of our team will endeavor to help you. Uh, and in the unlikely event we are uh, experiencing any issues, we will message the audience and try to restart the webinar, but that shouldn't happen, knock on wood. Um, so to summarize, you can submit those questions at any time today, and you'll also receive a follow-up email at the end to ask any other follow-up questions you may have. Um, just another quick thing, I would like to encourage any of you who are on Twitter to give us a follow. I can pop that up. Twitter handle in our chat box as well here. And if you have any comments or questions about the webinar today, you can use the Twitter hashtag uh, QPB webinars to share those thoughts. And with that, to kick things off, I will hand things over to Dale Sanders. Many thanks, Casey, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this QPB set webinar. I'm Dale Sanders, and I'm an advisor to the editorial board of the journal. I'm delighted today to introduce Pro Professor Olivier Armand to deliver his presentation on the 1972 Meadows Report, A Wake Up Call for Plant Science. Olivier is a research director in the Plant Reproduction and Development Lab at the University of Lyon and holds an adjunct position at the Sainsbury Lab in the University of Cambridge. Olivier's groundbreaking research has focused on the role of mechanical signals in plant morphogenesis, where his approaches combine molecular and cellular biology with modeling and biophysics. But Olivier's, science, Olivier's scientific contributions extend far beyond his chosen area of research. He is a vocal advocate of new thinking in publishing and ways to communicate research. He promotes scientific collaboration. Uh, in a way that will help solve big problems. And we'll hear more of that today, I think. And he also uh, has been very effective in demonstrating that quantitative biology is hugely important to society at large. And I think that will be another theme of today's talk. It's therefore a real honor to have Olivier as editor in chief of our journal and to be able uh, to have him speaking uh, with us today. So I'd now like to hand over to Olivier to present his talk on the Meadows Report. Olivier. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm very happy to, uh, to present this, uh, this work. So let me share my screen. Uh, so you should be able to see the slides. Yes, okay. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, the Meadows Report. So let, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, there is this uh, nice quote from uh, Carl Niklas, actually, that I, I use all the time. So the Earth is a blue planet but it's a green world. And this is sort of a tribute to plant science in some ways, because we are actually relying a lot on plants. Civilization depends on plants. And so here is uh, just um, a, a few uh, items. Uh, of course, there's uh, the water that you can see here. I mean, the cycle of water that depends on plants, uh, the soil. So here you see uh, lichens uh, that are, um, of course, the, the, one of the first pioneering plants that uh, can uh, generate soil from uh, mineral material. And of course, biomass, plant biomass, that's the source of uh, the, the most abundant resource for uh, ecosystems. And we all depend uh, on this. So that's the status, let's say, of our key resource for the planet. But of course, as humans, we've uh, colonized the planet and we've 
generated a number of problems. Huh? I'm, I'm fast tracking. I, I'm sure you, you know very well this kind of problem. So resource uh, scarcity, shortage of resources, climate crisis, biodiversity collapse, and global pollution. So these are the four main uh, items we have to deal with. And these are no new questions. And this, uh, this is something that we've been um, questioning for a number of uh, uh, decades, actually, or even centuries, I would say. But there is this report that I want to insist on today with um, this article and this, uh, this webinar. It's the, uh, the Meadows report, so the Club of Rome report. So here you can see the, the authors. And uh, in the middle, so the, the two lead authors that are Donella and Dennis Meadows, who were really like uh, behind the report. And all this was, was triggered by uh, Jay Forrester, which is, who is one of the, 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 the leader in systems thinking, was the one who, who made some of the very first uh, computational model um, in, in the field. So what is this uh, model about? So this was actually in the in the 60s, right? it started in, in the 60s. And the idea was to uh, do the first computational model of the world. So nothing less than this. So it's a pretty massive, uh, massive work. So the model is called World Free. And it integrates uh, everything pretty much we know on the planet with, of course, very uh, discrete uh, parameters. Uh, here, you just have a, a map where you see a little bit like what are the interactions. But to, just to get, give you an idea, uh, for instance, uh, there's one rule that says if you have more food, you will have more population. So you see, it's very, very simple rules. And there's an arrow uh, between these two parameters. So you see, it's very simple. There's only 180 parameters in this uh, model. So it's it's a pretty simple model compared to uh, the IPCC uh, model that we do uh, nowadays. Huh? The IPCC um, model today, they have like 10 million parameters. So this one is much, much simpler, but it's the first one. And so what does this uh, model produce? Uh, it produces this. And so here you see actually uh, Dennis Meadows at the Smithsonian uh, giving the speech in 1972. So this was when the, the report was uh, released. And so the, the model says that. So here you see on this graph, so this is actually from the, the report in 1972. Uh, you see that this is 1900 and this is 2100. So it's over two centuries. And you have different parameters. Uh, and actually these are in French on this one. So I should have translated it in English. Uh, this is population, this is pollution, this is uh, food, this is uh, industry. So you see all these different parameters are evolving uh, over time. And this is the standard run. So this is just if we, it's business as usual, if you want. So if we follow business as usual, the prediction from the Meadows report is that of a tipping point. A tipping point that would happen in the first half of the 21st century. And so this was a, a big shock to, to the community. I mean, I, I guess, well, it is one part that is very trivial. So we knew that uh, infinite growth on a finite planet can't go on forever. So we knew there would be a tipping point at some point. But the surprise is that it's much more short term than expected. So the prediction is that it would be in the first half of the 21st century. So, of course, there's a lot of buzz in the <laughs> in the 70s. Uh, the, the book is sold millions, it's translated in 35 languages, so it's, it's pretty uh, massive, um, it, has, it has a massive impact in, uh, in society. But there are other things in that report, and for instance, uh, they also explored other scenarios than the business as usual one. For instance, they explored the scenario where you have access to more resources. So you could you could think of uh, the equivalent today would be uh, deep sea mining, for instance. So if you if you go uh, extract resources that are not really accessible today, but if you can have access to them, what happens? And the model predicts uh, this. So you see the, the 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 black line is the population. So you see that the shift is still happening. The tipping point is still happening. There's no change. But actually, what happens is that you have more pollution. That's the dotted line here, and you see that the pollution are going to the sky. Yeah? So have access to more resources is just a way to generate more pollution. So definitely, that's a, it's a big lesson for us. We shouldn't look for more resources, definitely, from that, uh, at least from that report. And there, there was another uh, uh, model, let's say, uh, of parameters where they modeled what would happen if we have access to clean technologies. So if we have clean technologies, you see here the pollution is much less, right? Which is normal, right? There's less uh, the technology are cleaner. But you see that the tipping point is still here, uh, and it's it's delayed. So there's the positive point; it's delayed, but it's still here. And so this is maybe what the, what is the most uh, important message from this uh, report is that the prediction is that the tipping point happens, whatever happens, in the 21st century, and rather early than uh, late in the 21st century. 
Okay, so of course, this is from the, it was built in the 60s, was published in 72. Uh, there was a lot of criticism uh, in, the, in, the, in those age. In the 73, there is the oil crisis. So basically the report is buried and we sort of forget about it, right? There is not so much uh, momentum around the report. But this has changed in 2000. In 2000, uh, certain uh, Graham Turner from uh, Australia rerun the world free model with the parameters that had been accumulated in the past 30 years, so between 1970 and the year 2000. And so you see that the dotted line is the prediction from the Meadows report in 1972, and the plain line is the real data, the empirical data that have been accumulated uh, in the meantime. And you see that the plain line is following quite closely the dotted line. So this was a shock, a second shock, if you want, because this means that we are following the business as usual route, despite all the attention on the uh, environmental question. So this has been redone in 2010, so I don't show it here. So in 2010, uh, the, the curve actually goes a little bit below. So it's, it sort of starts to take off a little bit. It doesn't follow so closely the dotted line, but still not too far. So now the, the current prediction, I mean, the, the, the consensus, let's say, is that the tipping point will happen around mid 21st century, I would say something like this. So maybe you shouldn't pay attention too much to the 2030, uh, you know, uh, economic collapse. Uh, this is not a Mayan calendar, right? It's it's <laughs> it's just a rough estimate. There's going to be a tipping point in the 21st century, and it's probably will happen uh, around mid mid century. So this is actually a major uh, major thing. Okay, so what can we take from this? And as plant scientists and as scientists, actually. So there's one uh, sentence, one quote that I'd like to insist on. It's this one. Running the same system harder or faster will not change the pattern as long as the structure is not revised. So this is really a key, a key point, uh, I think, that we should keep in mind. Uh, because this is actually the definition of systems thinking. So when you when we say in uh, you know in public debate that we want to change the system, usually what we say what we mean is that we just want to change the elements in the system. This is not changing the structure of the system. If you want to change the structure of the system, you need to change the interactions in the system. And this is truly systems thinking. So let me give you an illustration of this that is not plant science related, but just to make it very clear. So this is, for instance, pseudo-systemic thinking. So this is not actually not system thinking. So we want to replace the, the thermal car, so the combustion, combustion, uh, combustion uh, engine car, with electric car. Is this really a systems change? Well, no, it's not a systems change because there will be as many cars, as many drivers, as many, you know, uh, garage, as many uh, highways. So this is not changing anything, right? This still, you haven't changed interaction. There's still an interaction between uh, some person and their car. So what would be the true system seeking for that question? So you start with same cars and drivers, and you move to shared car. And this is systems thinking because now you've changed interactions, right? And then you truly change the structure of the system. So this is just the example with uh, with the cars, but of course this has many uh, resonance in science and in research. How do we do uh, research? When we don't use systems thinking, what we do, what we use is reductionistic thinking. Thinking. So we sort of isolate little problems and we address them, thinking that if we resolve one problem after the other will resolve the entire problem. This has many problems. So here is one, for instance, Goodhart Law, which says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And so this is typically applicable to, uh, to science in general, and of course, plant science as well. So it's, for instance, so researcher, we, we do have a H index. So we publish in journals with impact factor, with our university that are following Shanghai ranking. So all this measure of performance, what is it, it's inducing, actually, we, we want to reach the maximum performance. And so we go too fast. Science is too sloppy. So see, there is more fraud over time, although this would need to be balanced with the number of uh, paper. But this actually, this recent article is quite uh, interesting. So this was uh, published in the Nature uh, this year, showing that uh, actually the, the, the paper that we publish, there is more and more papers, but they are less and less uh, disruptive. So I'm not sure we've gained so much with all this uh, impact factor and uh, quest for performance in uh, publishing. Uh, second thing is uh, reductionistic thinking. Uh, so if you 
of course, in science, we need to reduce our problem. Right? We, we can't solve a big problem. Uh, it, it, we can't be exhaustive, right? So we have to, to solve little problems one after the other. But we need to be aware that this is uh, reduction. That is too simplistic. And so, of course, you have these uh, pictures that you, I'm sure you've seen in many, many articles. I mean, I've, I've produced this kind of picture as well. But this is too simplistic, right? We can't say that one gene is responsible for the life of a plant, right? It's it's, it's just a construction, right? So well, I, I guess everyone is, is aware of this. This is something to, to be aware of. Uh, the other aspect uh, of uh, reductionism that can be problematic is uh, the rebound effect, which is uh, a classic. So a rebound effect is when you uh, you think that by making something more efficient, actually the entire system is going to be more efficient. But actually what happens is that one unit is becoming, becoming more efficient, but the entire system does not necessarily become more efficient. So here I take the example of uh, oil pan which is a, a classic example, as I said. So when we started to develop oil palm as a crop, the idea was to make uh, biofuels and uh, other items as well, and to reduce uh, the CO2 emission by you know, switching from fossil fuel to uh, biofuels. Of course, oil palm is a great plant for this because it has a very high yield. So per square meter, it's a very efficient crop. You produce a lot of oil for little um, uh, square area uh, surface area. But actually, what happens is that if you have a very efficient crop, then you generate new needs. And because you generate new needs, you plant more crop. And at the end, not only you produce more CO2, but you actually deforest more. You know that in, the, in Indonesia, we've lost the surface area of Sicilia in uh, five years. And this is mainly due to uh, oil palm uh, planting. So this is a typical rebound effect, something that is more efficient in a reductionistic uh, thinking does not necessarily make the whole system more uh, efficient. So the Meadows report is really a call for systems thinking everywhere in science and in plant science. And I want to insist on one uh, item, which is this one. When we are reductionistic, usually uh, in science or in technology, we put the focus on performance, which is, would be the, the sum of effectiveness and efficiency. You reach your goal with the least amount of means. So this is what you drive to do in science. When you do this, actually, you weaken the entire system. So as we are entering the fluctuating world, a turbulent world because of the climate crisis, pollutions, uh, etc., what we want to uh, increase in is, uh, in contrast, robustness. And robustness is a systemic uh, feature. And more robustness is they are both mutually exclusive. You can't be very robust and very efficient. It's physically impossible. So of course, how does this relate to uh, to biology? And actually, it relates a lot to biology because biological systems are robust, and they are robust against performance. And this is really what systems thinking has told us in the in the past twenty years, I would say, at least at the molecular level, but for a longer time at the ecosystem level. So we know that living beings are built on a number of inefficiencies, right? They don't have a goal, of course. A lot of heterogeneity, a lot of randomness. I mean, there's a whole field of biology that is called stochastic biology that is studying randomness only. Uh, slowness, a lot of delays, a lot of redundancy in biology, but millions of redundancy, right? You, you know this. A lot of incoherence, uh, incoherent feedforward loops, for instance, in uh, all uh, gene networks, for instance. And of course, everything is incomplete because if you're complete, you're dead, right? In the living system. System. So you need to be incomplete to be still uh, alive. And so all of this for a human from the 21st centuries are inefficiencies. But living beings and plants are using these inefficiencies to put some oil in the wheel. And this is what is creating uh, robustness. So I can just give you one example that uh, I like a lot in uh, plant science. It's photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, it exists for the past, it has existed for the past 3.8 billion years, the first isotopic trace of photosynthesis, it's 3.8 billion years ago. And the yield of photosynthesis is less than 1% in the field. It's 0 0.3 to 0.8%. So it's a very, very low yield. Uh, if you compare to uh, solar panels, uh, we are at 15% uh, nowadays. So uh, you, you see that the yield of photosynthesis, so the difference between the, the solar energy that uh, reaches the leaf and the metabolic energy that the, the plant is producing, it's very low. It's, it's not zero, but it's close to zero. So why is this so inefficient? 
Uh, I can refer you to this uh, Arpital uh, paper that shows that actually, uh, in a nutshell, photosynthesis is so low because it needs to manage fluctuation, light fluctuation and metabolic fluctuation. And so this is why the yield is so low. And so the, the, the photosynthesis message is very simple. It, it tells us that they are dealing with fluctuation. They don't care about the performance in some ways, right? So the, the focus is on fluctuation. This is selected during evolution in a turbulent environment. And so fluctuation is what is the, the first response for, for plants. That's what they focus on uh, the most, if I can say it like this. So if you look at uh, plants or any living beings, actually, what they are built on is all this randomness, redundancy, fluctuations, all these right inconsistencies. And all this is fueling adaptability, not adaptation, adaptability, right? So it's always you want to do things that can be a bit useless if you want at, at some point, but that but can be useful if the world is changing. And during evolution, this is adaptability that has been uh, selected. So this, and to finish, this should uh, enlighten us for plant science. And this is really what the Meadows report is telling us. The Meadows report is telling us that the world is going to change. It's going to change completely. It's an inversion. It's really an inversion. A complete inversion from you know before uh, the, the 20th century to the coming 21st century we are going to be on a different route a tra different trajectory and so this means that in plant science we will also need to accompany this inversion and so for instance i'm going to start with i'm going to give you uh, six examples of this uh, inversion so the first one is that a lot of the projects we do as plant biologists are still in the framework of monoculture uh, just by default, right? Because in the lab, we often use only one species. But actually, we know that monoculture is not the way forward, right? Uh, monoculture is uh, the drive for desertification, for a lot of pesticides, for fertilizer. I mean, you need to compensate a very poor uh, ecosystem with a lot of external uh, entrance. So what would be the inversion for this? Of course, it's mixed varieties. So it doesn't have to be super uh, uh, varied. Huh? It can, can be just three varieties of wheat in the same field. But this is already increasing the resistance of the field to drought and to pathogens. And so you see that this should be the background in which we work as plant scientists, right? So if we want to do applied research, applied plant agronomy, if we want to use systems thinking, the by default situation should be the mixed variety, not the monoculture. Second one is to, if we want to, uh, in the past, we wanted to do a new resistant species. But if we do this, if we want to make species that are super efficient, super resistant, this, going to, this is going to fuel monoculture again, right? And uh, rebound effects, uh, good outlaw, I mean, everything I've been telling you uh, before. So if we want to, uh, to fight this, and if we want to have a more systemic view on this, for instance, we could understand hardiness. So how come some plants are more robust than others? And so here, for instance, I, I take the, the example of uh, polar trees. So these are trees that you cut a lot. And so they developed, uh, they develop uh, extra proliferation of their cells or their tissues. And so there is some reports, but this needs to be studied huh, because this is an open question. But these plants, these polar trees are more resistant to fluctuation, to environmental fluctuations. So again, it's a, it's a question mark, but this is the type of question we should uh, address as uh, plant scientists instead of trying to make the, the best possible plant. Another one is biofuel. So if we want to make biofuels instead of oil fuel, uh, we, this is again redu reductionistic in thinking. Right? Because if we do biofuel, we still burn carbon. Right, We are still going to emit CO2. And to grow the plant, we're going to use fertilizer. And fertilizer, they need fossil fuel. So you see, the, the whole point, is, it's, it's a loop, right? So this is ill thought. At least the biofuel, the first or second generation, they're still quite ill thought. So what would be a much better uh, option, a much more systemic view on this? It's to invest in true bioeconomy. So instead of using plants, plant material to make biofuel, we should instead use plant to replace the minerals and the metals that we use in renewable energy. And so here I take the example of a recent paper from the, the team of uh, Thomas Dehoux, who uh, found actually that in uh, onion, uh, the epidermis of uh, onion, that the one that you can find in the supermarket, they have uh, phononic properties, so they can uh, absorb certain acoustic waves. And it turns out that this is some of the properties of the minerals we use in uh, smartphones, for instance. So the, the overall idea is to replace all our goods that are made of metals, of fossil fuel, 
with green carbon and to have the same properties through uh, this carbon. So that way you store CO2 in the material and uh, and, and then you, you don't extract all these minerals or this uh, fossil fuel. So this would be much more systemic. Another one uh, from the past is uh, precision agriculture. So this is uh, there's a lot of buzz around this with uh, drones, you know, like, and the idea is to have a more efficient agriculture because you would use less pesticides, less fertilizer, less water, because it's very precise. Of course, this will generate rebound effect, a lot of good heart law. This is promoting uh, monoculture. So again, this is a nil thought uh, um, thing. So what would be the, <laughs> the inverse of this? Of course, it's imprecision agriculture and imprecision agriculture is based on the density of interactions in the field. So that means that you need to include the microbiome, for instance. And there's a lot of studies on this. So this, the example I take here is actually an, an analysis of the microbiome in uh, Japanese uh, forest soils. And you can, if you identify the number of interactions, then you can have something a bit more imprecise, but then you let the field be more autonomous. And this is true uh, robustness. Another example of the past, the seed company Monopoly. So you know that there are five main seed companies in the world. Uh, and so this is a major uh, point of weakness uh, that to, to, I mean, to have the food dependent on just such a few uh, companies. This is definitely not robust at the world level. I mean, uh, you, you saw what happened as, as, as soon as there's a war somewhere. It's, it's a very fragile system. So what would be the, the robust uh, system with systems thinking? Uh, of course, it's to actually have particip participatory uh, research with situated knowledges. So this can be a participatory breeding uh, strategies. So that means that scientists, as scientists, we will have to uh, connect with citizens who are actually growing the crops themselves. And uh, this is actually very interesting. I uh, really invite everyone uh, listening to, to this webinar to actually do this uh, talk to the farmers, I mean, as a scientist, talk to the farmers, go to this participatory breeding, and then you learn a lot about what are the expectations, what are the problems of the farmers. And uh, and soon, actually, you'll find that you have some preconceived ideas. Huh? For instance, I can give the example uh, in the Lyon region. Uh, I thought that the local farmers had uh, issues with... Uh, uh, you know, uh, some sickness or some pathogens that they had in the field. Actually, this was not the main problem. Uh, rain was the main problem, like the, the fact that the, the, the wheat was uh, falling down. So it's just, um, yeah, it's, it's always uh, well, enlightening, I guess, to, to connect to the citizen. And this is the last, last point. Uh, in the past, uh, if we do top-down research, so that means that we create new species in labs and then we just give it to farmers, then the farmers are not autonomous. They are dependent on a distant technocracy and this is not robust in a fluctuating world where you i mean you saw with the covid crisis that we don't always have access to the resources to the energy to the i mean to the, the space canal can be blocked i mean all these kind of things so if we are too dependent on a too distant technocracy then food is not going to be robust so what would be the the inverse of course is to promote transdisciplinary research and so it's a little bit the same it's to promote citizen science and of course this is something uh, that uh, quantitative plant biology is doing a lot. At least that's really something that we believe in, both systems thinking and citizen science. And this is what the, the journal is about. So we're trying to promote quantitative thinking. So quantit quantitative thinking means that we want to address systemic question. So we can use reductionistic tools, but the question has to be systemic, right? That's that's the difference. And so we have a number of new formats that are trying to, to address this. So there's the citizen science format. We are the first plans journal to have a dedicated citizen science format. We have the classics format, which is, this is one example. So where we try to revive the old literature and to actually, you know, this seminal work that, uh, that can be inspiring. We want to put them back uh, on, on the table, insights for postdocs or a patient who want to talk about uh, inspiring uh, recent literature. And we also want to promote creative research. So there's uh, art and science collection, for instance. And this is something that is really important if we want to address the right question. All right, so I think I'll stop here with just, uh, so this is the article. So if you want to dig a bit deeper, so the, the, the classics I, I wrote for quantitative plant biology on this 1972 Meadows report. And I also wrote a book, so it's in French now, but there's going to be an English translation. It's called Suboptimality. And actually, uh, uh, Britt Koskela suggested uh, another uh, title, which I like a lot. It's called The Inefficient Truth. So it might, it might, be, vast, it might, it might be that uh, in the end. All right, so I'll take uh, any question uh, if you have some. Okay. 
do. All right, great. So at this time, I'm going to invite Ali to run our questions section. So Ali Paskins. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so I'm the the publisher for quantitative plant biology at Cambridge University Press. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Olivier, for for your talk there. Um, we've had a number of questions come in actually, so I'll uh, start to run through those now. Uh, but please do carry on sending in questions um, as as and when. Uh, so the first question is: Is syst is systemic robustness? synonymous with suboptimality <laughs> so yeah this is dear to to me so <laughs> I, I like the suboptimality uh, concept so suboptimality when i say suboptimal or maybe i should take a step back so you know as um, scientists or as citizens we always want I mean, we often want to have the maximum performance we know that the maximum performance is a bad idea because we you know everyone gets tired after a while we exhaust the resources so we don't want the maximum so the the danger would be to switch from maximum to optimum the optimum is also problematic because the optimum means that we know what the future is going to be like but the future is unpredictable so the optimum is true for a certain time point, but it's certainly not true for the future. So that's why we need to be sub-optimal, below the optimum, to have this leeway, right? To and and this is what plants are doing. They are suboptimal. They are suboptimal to manage this uh, unexpected fluctuation. So in some ways, suboptimality is the oper operational way to be robust. Let's put it that way. Great, thanks, Olivier. Uh, so the second question is, uh, you made a point of proposing systems thinking over reductionist thinking in the way we pursue our science. Um, but some of the greatest advances in biology have come about through reductionist thinking. Um, how, how can we combine both of the approaches? So, sorry, so this is a good question. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we should stop doing reductionistic uh, science. Huh? We, we are reductionistic in a way. We, I mean, when we talk to people, we talk to only one person, right? We don't talk to the entire world. So we are reductionistic in the way we interact with people. It's more the question. So, for instance, if you write an article, you, you do some research, it's going to be for necessarily reductionistic because you are going to address a small problem. Maybe it's more a discussion point in some ways on the introduction point. You can't say that you've solved the world by solving the, I don't know, the oxygen transduction pathway, for instance. No, that's not true, right? <laughs> and in some ways, uh, we this is the temptation that we have as a plant scientists is because we, we are so enthusiastic about our discovery is that we sort of make it like a bigger thing than what it is. And systems thinking is, um, well, really important for that is to make sure that actually we are really addressing the right question. The, the worst part would be to bring the best answer to the wrong question. And this is something that we do too often. I mean, I was taking and talking about the electric car. So the electric car is just a, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting project, but it's not the answer to everything, right? Uh, it's, so this is type, this type of uh, thinking. So I'm, I'm not opposing both, but we, we need to have more systems thinking. Right? Brilliant. Thanks, Olivier. So the next question is, uh, competition is deeply embedded in the mindset of many researchers. Um, do you have any mechanisms in mind that would help us move to a more collaborative framework for our research? So actually, that's uh, something that I think uh, quantitative plant biology is doing uh, in, uh, in essence. The, the, the first step to move to cooperation over competition is interdisciplinary research. So when you, uh, you're a biologist and you talk to a physicist, or if you talk to a mathematician, a modeler, or like a social scientist, I mean, anyone that is outside of your field, you can't be in competition because you don't know the other field. So you have to go into the other person's mind, get acculturated to, to what they, they think about. And so this is a very different um, uh, thinking because now the, the project is the core of the discussion. It's not you versus the others it's the project and that's the difference between uh, cooperation cooperation and collaboration actually even eh? cooperation is when you together you work towards the same goal and interdisciplinary research can only be co cooperative when you do collaboration actually you everyone independently move on their subject hoping that the addition of the positive uh, projects will be a positive the global positive but this is it's a win-win right but there's always someone that loses in the win-win scenario so cooperation 
is really the way to go uh, in the future. And when there's less resources, financial resources uh, including, we want to do cooperation. And so interdisciplinary research, that's uh, one way forward, for sure. Great. Thanks, Olivier. Um, so the next question is, how can mixed agriculture with one or two crops be better than monoculture? Uh, so, for example, if the mixed system outperforms monoculture, it might lead to rebound effects and deforestation. And also having two or three crops on the field is still not biodiverse. Yeah, so the, the, the nice thing with uh, mixed varieties is that there's an incoherent feed forward loop inside the system. So it can't go uh, to an uh, amplification, to an uh, escalation, let's say. So for instance, I'm going to take a very clear example. So in wheat, for instance, so if you have three different varieties of wheat in a field, that field is going to be more resistant to drought and more resistant to pathogens. The yield is going to be a bit lower, though. So it's again, huh? you gain robustness, but you lose performance. You, you can't have it all, right? But that's what is preventing the rebound effect, is that in, in the end, you have something that is more robust, but a bit less uh, performant. But if uh, the, the other alternative is if we, if we want to, uh, if we went to, towards uh, monoculture, then we would make the field super efficient, but then we desertify the field, and then you have nothing, right? Or, or there's a big fluctuation, but then there's nothing. So the, the and, and the, I mean, it, it's been studied a lot. Huh? So this is known for the past uh, 10, 20 years now. Right? It's very well established. Uh, and even the farmers now are doing it. Even the seed companies are selling mixed varieties. So just to say that now it's it's not even a question anymore. And so this should be our, you know, by default uh, scientific context, I would say. Correct. Um, so the next question is, um, and just tell me if any of these are overlapping with ones you already answered, uh, what would a successful narrative today be with respect to the tipping points horizon? Oh, the narrative. So, uh, well, <laughs> so I like the idea of inversion, right? Because we, uh, if, you, if you look at the curve of the Meadows report, it's really an inversion, right? So it's, we are changing, uh, we are changing the civilization. The civilization is going to change. Huh? It's, it's really a tipping point for the past 10,000 years huh? since the Neolithic age. Huh? So this is, it was really flat. There was the great acceleration and now we're going down. But the, the, for me, the narrative shouldn't be the narrative of the collapse. You know, there's a lot of uh, text and uh, in the media, we talk about the, the crap. It's not a collapse. It's a tipping point. It means that we are going to change the way we do uh, science. The, the, the economy is going to change. Everything is going to change. So it's not a transition. It's not a bifurcation. It's an inversion. We basically do the, a little bit the opposite of what we did before. And uh, to me, uh, we are not going to regret the, the past time, right? So if we move from performance to robustness, actually, this is really an engaging uh, future, right? It's, it's, uh, to me, it's an answer to eco-anxiety, actually. <laughs> so if we develop robust strategies in science and in society, now we can really be, uh, we can see the future, right? It's, um, so I, I, but the narrative, actually, that's why I think biologists have a lot to do on this, and the cell and developmental biologists in particular, uh, or systems biologists, because we can explain that robustness goes against efficiency. And so this is really the, the point that can be a good narrative. And it's actually, it's also a way to reconnect to the living beings, right? So it's, that can be the narrative biology. Great. Okay, so the next one is, uh, with the climate crisis getting worse, do you think that people have a limited amount of time to change their agricultural ways to help turn around CO2 emissions? And if so, how long do you think people have? So uh, I can, uh, so I don't know for the entire world, of course, but I can give you an example for, for France that I know a bit better. Uh, in 2010, there was only 5% of the surface area that was cultivated in a mixed variety for wheat. In 2020, in certain regions, it was up to 40%, for zero. So this means that in 10 years, uh, the agriculture in France has already shifted towards from monoculture to mixed varieties. In, uh, I'm sure in 10 years, it's going to be mixed varieties everywhere, agroforestry, permaculture. I mean, this is a movement that is going very, very fast. So I would say I'm, I'm quite optimistic uh, in the sense that the farmers are the first one to experience the climate crisis. And they're the first, they're not stupid. Huh? They see that it's actually working much better, that it's more robust and that they're more autonomous. So this is going, I think, I suspect this is going to go uh, relatively fast in agriculture. I think the, the main problem is uh, some breaks, uh, some lobbies, of course, that are going to, to, to slow this down. Uh, but the, the farmers, they are ready, actually. When you, when you talk to them, they are ready uh, for, for the turn. So I, I would be relatively optimistic, let's say. 
I don't I can't give a date though. <laughs> and I don't want to give a date. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um so the next one is GMO including editing uh, is seen as a typical top down approach. However, however they are simply another way to get new varieties which is something that's needed. How could one use this approach for a more integrated agricultural practice? Yeah, so it's um, definitely GMO are part of the solution. It, the, the danger would be to say GMO are the solution, right? That's reductionistic thinking. If you say GMO is part of the solution, then you're more, you know, systems thinking. It's the GMO, but there's also other things. And one uh, idea would be to, uh, of course, go towards open science. So if you, if you do a GMO, you don't want to make GMOs that are, you know, uh, secluded to one specific company and that the farmers have to order every year. So this is the past, right? If you want to have a robust agriculture, uh, the farmers have to be autonomous and they have to be able to grow their own seeds and to sh share their own seeds. That, that would be the, and then GMO, everyone will be happy to have a GMO. I think. Great. Thanks, Olivier. And the next question is, in crop research, one major goal is to breed plants with both high yield or quality and resilience to stresses, biotic or abiotic, abiotic. Would that be consistent with the suboptimal scenario? Well, partly I would say so. The, the, it's just that the, some of the crops we grow, uh, we grow them with the mind that the, these plants will be grown in a greenhouse or in a very controlled environment. And so if, if this is the case, then it's true you can go for maximal yield because you have a stable environment. If you grow the same plants outside in a fluctuating environment, and as we know, the environment is going to be more and more turbulent. This is, you don't want maximal yield, you want to have maximal robustness. So it all depends on what you grow. So if you want to grow, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't cash crops in a very small amount, in a very controlled environment, you can go for maximal yield. If you want to grow wheat, or if you want to grow rice, you certainly don't want maximal yield, you want robust yield. And this can't be, we can't have both, right? You can't have high performance and high robustness. Great. Uh, so for now, I think we've got one more question, but do keep sending them in if, if you have any. So uh, your appeal to systems thinking will involve collaboration with individuals whose expertise lies uh, well outside of the academic range that we encounter as plant biologists, uh, such as economists or social scientists. Do you have any thoughts on how we can go about breaking down interdisciplinary barriers? So this is, of course, the, the, the hardest, huh? the, the transdisciplinary uh, research, because now you, you talk to people who are who don't some don't have an academic background or are very specialized in one field. And so it's, sometimes it's hard, you know, to find a common ground. But you can turn this around, because if you talk to someone who is very far from your field, that person is going to reformulate your questions. And then suddenly you will see whether your questions are actually the right ones or not. So this is actually the first thing that is really nice with uh, transdisciplinary research is that your questions are evolving even before the, the answers, right? So you're, you have actually better questions. The, your questions are more pertinent. It's, it's almost like a stress test on your question. Are you sure you're asking the right question? So if you're not sure, Ask someone who is really far away from you, a citizen, someone who is not a scientist, and then you'll see if it's, you know, a, a pertinent question. After that, uh, on the uh, how to, to do this, uh, time is the key. So if you want to do trans transdisciplinary research, you want to make sure that you have enough time, a lot of, you know, back and forth uh, over the long time so that people can integrate uh, on both sides, huh? uh, both the scientists and the non-scientists. It also means but you want to let go a little bit of the dogma of performance in uh, in science. Let's say, but if you do trans, trans, transdisciplinary research, you're likely you're not going to publish in nature or science, right? It's going to be uh, situated knowledge, so very uh, less universal in some ways, but more robust in the sense that you reconnect science and society. And the only way we can reconnect science and society is if we scientists go towards society. It, it doesn't, it's not magic, right? It doesn't, science and society happens only if we do it. So some of us, at least, not maybe not everyone, but some of us, we have to go to society. And so this is the point of citizen science article in uh, quantitative plant biology, is to promote this. And this is really key for the future. In the era of uh, fake news and AI, citizen science is really, really, really important. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Olivia. Um, so I think that's it for questions. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Casey now, who will close the webinar. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Olivier. Thanks, Dale. Uh, great. Let me just share a couple more slides with you all. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. There we are. Um, great. So I just want to say a quick thank you so much for everybody for attending today. Uh, if there are no other questions, we will have an email going out after this webinar, so feel free to be submitting uh, more questions and we can try to get those answered for you as well. I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar and found it useful to hear from Olivier and Dale and learn more about quantitative plant biology. Uh, we do have a few ongoing collections, calls for papers, so feel free to go to our website and consider submitting to the journal as well. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for taking part. Uh, there are more webinars coming up in this series, so please uh, keep posted on our webpage and I'll uh, look out for those upcoming ones. And if that's all, thanks so much for attending. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> all right.